Thank you for joining us here at the Center for Global Security Research within the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory. My name is Asmara Esquetom, and I'm the Associate Director, uh, Associate Deputy Director of the Center. Many of you are probably familiar with today's speaker, Brad Roberts. Uh, Brad is the Director of CGSR and is here to speak about a report that the Center just published called China's Emergence as a Second Nuclear Peer, Implications for U.S. Nuclear Deterrence Strategy. You can find the report on our website. So the report captures the perspectives of a study group convened by CGSR, and Brad was the group chair. The group consisted of 18 members spanning 12 institutions. Uh, the report seeks to influence new thinking on U.S. nuclear deterrence strategy in light of the two near peer problem. For those of you that are not familiar with Brad, before coming to CGSR, he held multiple positions in government and academic institutions, most notably from 2009 to 2013. He was Deputy Assess Assistant Secretary of uh, Defense for Nuclear and Missile Defense Policy. And during that time, he served as the Policy Director for the Obama Administration's Nuclear Posture Review and Ballistic Missile Defense Review. He's also held uh, multiple positions at George Washington University and Stanford University. As with all of our CGSR lectures, Brad will present for about 45 minutes and then we'll turn to the audience for questions. You don't have to wait until the end of the lecture to indicate that you have a question. Feel free to raise your hand electronically during the lecture and I'll get you into the queue. If you prefer to type in your questions in, into the chat, that works as well. I can read them off to Brad. Um, with that, it's my pleasure to welcome Brad and I'll turn the floor over to him to get us started. Thank you, Asmaret. And it's uh, a pleasure to see the role reversal here and see you in the chair for this mm -hmm. session. Thank you for doing so. No problem. And thanks. Thanks everybody for joining us this morning. I appreciate your interest in the topic uh, and the chance to share with you this work. Uh, if, if you've attended one of the other talks that I've given in recent months, you, you'll be aware of one of the main themes emerging from CGSR's work uh, is the following, uh, that, uh, that at the end of the Cold War, we passed through a period of fundamental change in the security environment that led to fundamental changes in U.S. nuclear strategy and posture. Uh, in today's world, we're passing through a similarly significant shift in the security environment and in its implications for the U.S. nuclear strategy and posture. One of the most important shifts in the security environment is the emergence of a second nuclear peer. Uh, we've only historically had one major power to worry about from the perspective of our deterrence and assurance strategies and our strategic stability and arms control strategies, uh, but we're soon going to have two. Uh, and uh, we decided to take on that question of uh, what that would mean, what, that would, what implications that would have for U.S. nuclear strategy and, and posture, uh, and and this this report, which will be available for for pickup by hard copy from from our offices um, next week, but um, which is available as as Osmer had indicated for downloading from the website. Uh, this report is our our effort to frame the debate. So, as uh, uh, Mariah, let's go ahead and bring up the slides. And I'll work through them. Thank you. So this is a, a report of a study group. Next slide, please. We post three main questions. What's the new problem? Are the fundamentals of strategy sound? How should the practice be uh, adapted? Uh, we had to remind ourselves repeatedly in the course of this work that it's it's not a study of China's rise and China's nuclear modernization program. It's a study of the one plus one equals three problem. What's the three? What's the new problem presented by two having two peers to contend with simultaneously? Next slide, please. Uh, as Marta already gave you a brief overview of the group, but this is a bipartisan group. 
It includes uh, four former Deputy Assistant Secretaries of Defense. It includes a former STRATCOM commander. It includes uh, a lot of government advisors. It includes a couple of uh, folks from Capitol Hill, a couple of allies. So uh, a broad base of expertise, mostly drawing on nuclear strategy expertise. And we were all participating in our private capacities, so you'll understand completely that I'm not presenting Livermore Laboratory's view of this matter or NNSA's. These are just the views of this study group. Uh, and the participants align themselves with the general thrust of the report, although they may not agree fully with every particular point made in it. Next slide, please. So this is the structure of uh, the report and of my presentation to you of its findings and recommendations. We begin by talking about the two-peer problem. What is it? Next slide, please. The whole is more than the sum of the parts, but the parts matter. Uh, China is pursuing a significant increase of strategic. China hasn't told us how many nuclear weapons it has, how many it expects to have, how many delivery systems it expects to have. All of the information that's in public play on this is made available by the U.S. government. All that President Xi Jinping has said about the ultimate goal of his military modernization is that he's trying to create a military that supports his view of China being at the center of the world stage, comma, in the dominant position. We have a lot of discussion in the United States about whether China is seeking nuclear parity with the United States. There's no parity in, the, in this particular concept. Uh, and uh, the particular risk for deterrence strategy is that Russia and China will find opportunity to collude in crisis and war and present the United States with two simultaneous or nearly simultaneous crises and possibly wars uh, with a nuclear dimension. Next slide, please. We discovered as we worked our way into this that we as a working group actually had two ideas about what the problem was. Some were focused on the three new ICBM fields uh, and the current modernization program and the fact that China has emerged with it will have by 2027, if, if we use New START counting rules, New START won't be enforced in 2027, China is not a member, but using New START counting rules you can see that the China uh, will by 2027 be a near peer. Uh, it won't have nearly as many deployed warheads as the United States and Russia, but it will have a robust triad. Uh, and um, this makes it a problem of the here and now. Then others in the study group were focused on the longer term problem. The statements by DOD that by 2035, China may have as many as 1,500 or more weapons. Um, the emerging problem is that 2027 will come and go, but China and Russia won't stop building. Uh, and this uncertainty about what they do next is a key feature of the emerging two-peer problem. So two problems, not one each requiring its own response, both of them requiring responses in the here and now. Next slide, please. So our first question about the implications was about the fundamentals of deterrence. Do they remain sound? And from our review of deterrence strategy, nuclear deterrence strategy, and nuclear employment strategy, we found no basic question about the value of a deterrent strategy based on putting at risk what enemy leaders value. That's our basic strategy for nuclear deterrence. But the emerged and emerging problems do pose a question about the continued value of counterforce. It, it was when China was a country with 18 to 20 ICBMs, which it was not so very long ago, it was possible to contemplate the possibility of an effective damage limiting strike on China. But it, when it becomes a country with 1,500 deployed weapons, 
uh, an effective damage limiting strike is going to be far from plausible. So this raises a question about the continued value of having a counterforce capability in the overall force, U.S. force structure. And in our judgment, uh, there's a good case for continuing to have a role for counterforce in U.S. nuclear strategy. Uh, they contribute some flexibility in the limited kinds of escalation scenarios that we think are plausible in the, the world we're moving into. Uh, moreover, this is a security environment, which includes a, a third additional nuclear adversary, North Korea, and may include a fourth soon, Iran. And we would like to not make it possible for them to think that they could first strike on the United States with a few nuclear weapons and eliminate most of our strategic potential. The, the ICBMs raised this price to entry to nuclear war on America. Someone contemplating a first strike on the United States has to contemplate striking many hundreds of targets, not just a few if the ICBMs were gone. So we draw on long standing, well, long, uh, long declassified nuclear guidance. Uh, which in the 1970s and 80s said that we, sh we should, uh, counterforce capabilities should be planned to the extent practicable with available forces. Uh, and we think that makes good sense in a two peer world as well. Um, the two problems also raise a question about the potential necessity to prioritize in some way. Uh, and, and there is a lot of discussion about. We don't really need to respond to China's nuclear emergencies appear in, in any in any novel way with any adjustments to our strategy or posture. We can just accept more risk. And our our group was pretty hard over on. We've already accepted enough risk in our nuclear deterrence posture and strategy. Uh, we see already that assurance is faltering in South Korea, uh, and um, uh, so the U.S can't choose a priority here. It, it has to do both these things and it has to do them equally well. Next slide, please. So now we move into the implications for different US nuclear practices. Uh, the first is uh, implications for the sizing and shaping of US strategic nuclear forces. Our core findings here are that for today's nuclear requirements, US nuclear forces are marginally sufficient. But for tomorrow's requirements, the deficiencies become more striking. And here's this interesting statistic. Uh, I mean, I, when I was a DASD for nuclear deterrence policy in 20, 2009, uh, we were des designing the uh, negotiating objectives for the new START treaty uh, and, and set on our objectives with an understanding of what the force was required to do in the way of putting at risk enemy ICBMs. And what you can see is the period between entry into force of New START and expiration of New START in 2026, the number of adversary deployed ICBMs will have ne nearly doubled. This, this raises a question about whether we have enough um, weapons, and this goes back to the, the counterforce question. So recommendations, next slide. Uh, we make six, uh, maintain the triad, uh, make changes to both strategic and non-strategic nuclear forces, plan to upload, exercise upload, develop contingency plans to do more, and maintain a secure reserve. These are some not very controversial recommendations, some very controversial. The recommendation to upload some warheads onto SL, submarine launch ballistic missiles uh, is one that's very difficult for uh, the policy community to accept because it implies an end to the nuclear reduction process, at least temporarily, an end to the nuclear reductions process that's been underway since 1986. Um, someone pronounced recommendation three heretical. Uh, but we have maintained a hedge 
against a geopolitical surprise. That hedge exists in the form of uploadable weapons, essentially weapons downloaded under implementation of New START. Uh, China's strategic breakout of ICBMs is just the kind of geopolitical surprise we were hedged against. It's time to implement the geopolitical hedge. That's recommendation three. Next slide, please. So if you've um, implemented the hedge, you have to reset the hedge. How do you do that? Well, the two-peer problem presents new challenges for which the U.S. is not adequately prepared and, and won't be if it implements the geopolitical hedges we recommend. It, it doesn't have the capacity to field in any timely fashion additional weapons or new weapons of different types. Uh, this is unhelpful for arms control. It creates no incentive for our adversaries to negotiate with us. Next slide, please. So our recommendations are uh, implement the geopolitical hedge, reset the hedge, but sim don't simply replenish the supply of weapons you've uploaded. Get on with doing what policymakers have always called for for 30 years and we've not accomplished, which is the, the investment necessary to create a, an agile infrastructure. But don't focus primarily on the quantitative challenge presented by the emerging 2035 problem. There are, th there are a couple of other problems that we think it's important to be well hedged against that wouldn't really be surprises if they happen. One is the deployment by Russia and or China of novel strategic weapons. We're not suggesting that the United States needs to match those deployments with equal capabilities of our own, but the introduction of novel strategic systems by Russia and or China opens up the question of whether additional strategic systems for the United States make sense. We should have the capability to build some novel systems. Um, the other surprise we'd like to be hedged against is the possibility, so-called surprise, the possibility that China will follow Russia in developing a strong theater nuclear posture. China has built up a very large missile force at the theater level, numbering, well, depending on your source, seven to 900 at least theater range ballistic and cruise missiles all understood to be dual capable. Uh, and and uh, if, if, and let's recall that uh, the Russians have bragged about building a nuclear scalpel for every military problem in Europe. If China develops an appetite for a nuclear scalpel for every military problem in Asia, well, our extended deterrence is not going to be up, up to that task. We'll come to that next. But those are the two forms of, quote, surprise that we think the infrastructure should be capable of addressing in a timely fashion, in addition to just the question of producing additional weapons. Next slide, please. Extended deterrence. We ended up spending a lot of time on this topic because this is a big deal in the two-peer world. Uh, our allies are in the in the nuclear crosshairs of our adversaries. Um, they're not just convenient points of leverage over the United States. They are the prize. Russia and China are trying to remake the regional security orders with the U.S. out. That means that our allies have to accept that result. They are under. They are in the nuclear crosshairs. Moreover, a failure of extended nuclear deterrence is the most likely path to a large-scale nuclear exchange. And in a two-peer world, the United States must convince both its adversaries and its allies and partners that those allies and partners will not be left without nuclear protection 
in even the most stressing scenarios in a two-peer world. Well, this isn't the world for which our extended nuclear deterrent was designed. Our extended nuclear de deterrent was basically designed in the early 1990s, <clears throat> part of the presidential nuclear initiatives, which were reciprocal steps by the United States and Russia to step back from the Cold War nuclear confrontation. And that time, uh, the, the United States withdrew 97% of its weapons from Europe, 100% of its weapons from Asia, removed them from naval surface combatants, and removed them from attack submarines, but put those weapons, the Tomahawk nuclear cruise missile, into storage for possible future redeployment in support of allies, particularly in Northeast Asia, in time of crisis and war. That remains our posture. Uh, and obviously today's world is not 1991. Next slide, please. So there's a lot underway to strengthen deterrence, and we've got to make good on those existing commitments. For a sub bullet under point one, um, I mean, I, I, I helped write the policy that said dual capable aircraft would be made globally available to allies because we were retiring Tomahawk in 2010. Uh, that capability has never been demonstrated or exercised. That worries our allies. Um, we see a need to supplement these capabilities with improved means to forward to, to deploy forward deploy additional theater U.S. nuclear forces. Uh, the the group was universal in supporting further development of slick men and production. There was a division of opinion over deployment on, on the argument that um, deploying slick men onto attack submarines in the Pacific would mean undeploying non-nuclear cruise missiles, which are needed for the primary line of deterrence of China, maritime conventional dominance. Uh, and we, we, ha we have constraints today in the SSB, uh, the attack submarine force that would be accentuated and not alleviated by the introduction of slick men. So some debate around slick men as, as always. Um, you've been able to read the other bullets. Our, 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 our fundamental recommendation on extended deterrence is be ambitious here. Um, the, we need a new division of deterrence labor with our allies, between our allies, among our allies, regionally and globally. Um, here's the posture we're in. Here's the current division of labor. We forward deploy some non-strategic weapons in Europe. We promise our East Asian allies to make some of those assets in Europe available in Asia in time of crisis. In a two-peer world, a crisis in Asia is going to be a crisis in Europe. So if there's a demand signal from East Asia for in time of a Taiwan crisis for some deployment of US dual capable aircraft, that's precisely the moment NATO is not going to think that's a good idea. Uh, we, we can't cover both of these requirements the way we've said we, we would. Um, this is a problem that needs to be fixed. It's a, it's a problem with quantitative and qualitative dimensions. Next slide, please. If you think survivability is a hard problem against one nuclear peer, well, if you have a simultaneous crisis with two, it's a lot harder. It's going to be very hard to have adequate warning of a strategic attack in a two-peer world. Uh, thus, we make some recommendations near-term and long-term. One through four are near-term, five through seven are longer-term. Um, but the point here is to, is to um, take measures so that we don't simply have to rely on more deployed weapons, a sort of crude quantitative response to ensure survivability when there are many things we can do qualitatively. Next slide, please. 
arms control strategy. Uh, it would be great for stabilizing tripolar competition, but we don't have willing partners. And this is unlikely to change anytime soon. Neither Russia nor China is interested in reducing their nuclear forces. Um, China is not interested in transparency on its nuclear forces. Both would make a deal with the United States, I believe, if, you, if the U.S. put missile defense on the table, but we're not going to because we feel vulnerable to threats from North Korea and Iran. Um, all of that said, you can't just walk away from the arms control table. Uh, there's a political requirement. Our democracies require a viable escape from the dilemmas and fears of the nuclear era. It, it doesn't have to be plausible in the near term, but it has to be on the table. We observe also that effect, successful negotiations require bargaining chips and that uh, there's a mismatch here. Next slide, please. So our recommendations are to prepare simultaneously for a world with and without arms control. Uh, with arms control means crafting a proposal. We recommend uh, making a deal with Russia if one's possible even if China opts not to join. And what we, we would value most at this point would be transparency over reductions. You know, reductions are hard to make at the same time China's uh, coming up. And um, we need a long-term strategy for competition that creates incentives for Russia and China to negotiate is the, the intended meaning of the three horses crossing the finish line at the same moment. Next slide, please. Lastly, we found ourselves thinking that it was necessary to talk about how to talk about the two-peer problem. Um, because the, what, the way we've been talking about it is Gosh, this is a hard new problem. It's going to further erode the deterrence environment. Uh, big new challenges, uh, capabilities unsuited to the task. Well, that's all music to the ears of Presidents Putin, Xi, and Kim Jong Un. So, how should we talk about this? Uh, we we, we recall Teddy Roosevelt, whose famous slogan was "Walk softly, but carry a big stick." Talk talk softly, but carry a big stick. Um, we need the big stick, but how to talk softly here is challenging given the contested and indeed adversarial character of the security environment. I mean, as you all know, Russia and China are messaging fast and furiously on, on this matter and to, and to their advantage. And our, our recommendation is to basically to build on the commitment in the national defense strategy to develop uh, deterrence campaigns and to make information campaigns an integral part of those deterrence campaigns and to, to engage our allies in the production of those campaigns and, and execution. So there's a strategic communications implication here as well. Next slide, please. So this is the summary of our recommendations. Align strategy with the need to deter simultaneously. Upload, exercise upload, reset the hedge, strengthen extended deterrence, improve survivability, prepare simultaneously for a world with and without arms control, do the information strategy well. To us, that looks kind of balanced. We're not suggesting respond to the worst case uh, with the strongest possible measures. We're not suggesting just accept more risk. Um, we've tried to, we, we didn't try to find a middle path. We think we ended up on, on a middle path. 
because there are more extreme views about the necessary solution. Next slide, please. We, we close with two, two observations aimed principally at the Strategic Posture Commission. Uh, we observed that for the last three decades, since, since the first iteration of the Strategic Posture Commission in 2008, the nuclear business of the nation has gotten done. We can't say that there's been bipartisan consensus, but there's been bipartisan support on a few key issue areas, nuclear modernization, verifiable nuclear arms control, nuclear nonproliferation, uh, sufficient bipartisan support to get the nation's business done. Well, we're moving off of those comfort zones. Uh, our call for additional capability, our call for upload, our call for our, 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 our statement that we're not going to have an arms control solution anytime soon. These are all outside of the comfort zones that have governed our success in modernizing and moving forward policy for the last 15 years. This is a new political reality. Uh, and and uh, business as usual politically on nuclear isn't going to work. So uh, we were trying to inspire the Posture Commission to do the necessary framing of these issues in a way that um, will uh, increase the odds of successful continuity. Uh, and and we, we, we close on the note that if we fail to adapt our deterrence posture in, in some manner to the two-peer problem and to the other challenges that are emerging, this will reinforce the perception of American decline and retreat and further magnify the deterrence challenge in front of us. So we see a lot at stake in taking the difficult steps we've called for to adapt to this new problem. Next slide, please. The glorious disclaimer. You all know it. Uh, I think that's it. Let's take down the slides and proceed to the Q&A. Asma, right back to you. Yeah, thank you, Brad. That was a really great overview of the findings and recommendations.